Right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I see the participant numbers are slowly increasing, but I think I'm going to kick off with the introductions at least. Welcome to the second of our seminars that is focused on the retail industry in particular and the employment law issues facing the industry. In the first session, what we did was focused on the COVID impact on the industry. And then what we wanted to do in respect of the second session was face on, uh, focus on a number of material issues that are going to be facing the industry in the future. And we've identified four broad themes that we want to talk about. The first one is the changes to the Employment Equity Act and the implications that that is going to have. The second is the issue around the changing nature of the retail industry, the move to online that has been exacerbated by COVID and the impact that that could potentially have in the industry. The third issue is we want to just talk about part-timers and uh, the extensive use of part-timers in the industry and some of the challenges we're facing. And finally, we want to just talk about restructuring and changes to terms and conditions, which are issues that the industry is going to have to face. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the technology, you'll be able to see the participants. You yourselves are not visible and are muted. There is a chat function at the bottom of your screen where you can ask panelists questions and please feel free to use the chat function. I'll monitor, monitor it from time to time just to make sure that everybody's on board. Just to introduce the panelists, you're probably all familiar with Siobhan Layden, who's the director of the Retail Association. Um, then we have Randall Fanfour and Mendel Sass, who are directors in our Cape Town office in our employment practice. And today we're joined by Ros Davy from our Joburg practice, who specializes in demarcations and uh, what happens if you fall into two different industries and when you do. So she'll be dealing with that. So what I'm going to do is kick off with the changes to the Employment Equity Act. Siobhan, you've been very close to what's been happening on the ground with this amendment to the Employment Equity Act, in particular the impact it's going to have retail. Maybe if you can just share with us some of your experiences and background, and then I'll turn to Randall to try and get legal input on that as well. So over to you. Thank you, Graham, and good morning to all of the participants. Just to start off with a very brief background on how the draft amendment bill to the Employment Equity Act came about. In 2017, the Department of Employment and Labor tabled at NEDLAC the draft amendment bill for, for engagement by the social partners. There were approximately six months of negotiations on, on, on the draft. Subsequent to the NEDLAC process in September 2018, government published in the Government Gazette the, the, the draft amendment bill as well as the draft regulations for public comment. In February 2020, Cabinet approved the amendment, um, amendment bill. And most recently, on the 20th of July 2020, the Minister of Employment and Labour published a notice in the Government Gazette to indicate that the amendment bill would be tabled at the National Assembly. So that's where we currently stand with, um, with the amendment bill. Most of the proposed amendments are administrative in nature, and, but the most significant changes, there, there are two of them. The first one is the amendment bill empowers the Minister of Employment and Labour after consultation with sectors to prescribe numerical employment equity targets at each of the occupational categories. The second significant change, but, um, but not necessarily applicable to, to retail, is the issue of a compliance certificate. If an employer does business with the state, it is required to be in possession of a compliance certificate to confirm that it complies with the Employment Equity Act and that it meets the targets that will be prescribed if it wants to tender, tender for work. From, a, from the perspective of the Retail Association, just to give the participants an understanding of what, what has transpired over the last three years and, and our involvement 
um, in the process was shortly after government published the amendment bill in the Gazette for public comments, the Department of Employment and Labor contacted me in October 2018 and said that they wanted to start the consultation process in order to engage on the targets that would be set for, for the retail sector. At that point in time, and still, um, and it, it remains the same today, the amendment bill has obviously not yet been passed as law. So initially, the retail association was very hesitant to engage with the department on the proposed targets for our sector and that we felt that the consultation process was premature in that because the amendment bill was, is not yet law, the minister doesn't have the power to start, start that consultation process. Um, however, um, after much reflection amongst the members of the retail association, we took a decision um, to, to rather actively participate in the process um, in the interests of transformation in our sector, as opposed to refusing um, to consult. So in October 2018, there was an introductory meeting between the retail association as well as representatives from the Department of Employment and Labor. And really at that meeting, um, the Department of Employment and Labor introduced how it envisaged the consultation process to take place. Um, and just to note that at that point in time, the retail sector was the first sector to be contacted by the department to start the consultation process. Since then, the department has started consulting with other sectors, of which I know being the um, banking sector as well as the, the mining sector. And I believe or understand that they may have started consulting with the agricultural sector this year. But, but what we made clear at the first meeting, the introductory meeting, if I can call it that, to the department was that the retail association is a very small association of um, retail employers and it is not representative of the sector at large. And we made it very clear to the department that it would be insufficient for the department to only consult or engage with the retail association. So what we then did was we provided the department with the contact details of other associations that represent retailers. And we also suggested that they perhaps also make contact with um, the, foreign, um, the foreign retailers who operate in South Africa, because as far as we know, um, not many or none of them are, are members of, of, of associations. So the department undertook to do so and it went away and started contacting um, other associations. In, in 2019, there were several meetings held between the Department of Labor and the Consumer Goods Council of South Africa, as well as the Retail Association, where the department made a proposal on what it envisaged the targets for, for our sector to be. And there was a lot of back and forth. Um, but I, I'm not going to go into to all of the detail because of, of the, the time constraints of this webinar, but just to give an overview of what the Department of Employment and Labor had proposed at, um, at the first, first meeting. And that was, and I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna give the breakdown, um, the ACR breakdown or the, or the gender breakdown, but just as an example, at top management, they were proposing 50% for ACI and overall ACI. Um, at senior management, 60%, um, at professionally qualified, 75%, skilled 88% and then disability a target of 2% and they wanted a 50-50 gender split for that disability target. So um, through engagements with the retailers who, who, who indicated that they wanted to participate in, in the consultation process with the department while noting that the consultation process is premature, um, the Retail Association and CGCSA, based on the mandate it received from the participating members, went back to the department and, and made a proposal, a counter proposal, if I can call it that, in response to the, the targets proposed. Um, so if we go back to top management, the, um, the proposal made by the, the participating members was 32%. So you'll recall I said that um, what the department had proposed was 50%. At senior management, the proposal from the sector was 56%. At 
and then professionally qualified um, agreement was reached on the 75% and the 88%. On the disability, the sector, the participating members had proposed um, 1.2% disability target with no gender split. Um, and what I must note is that the counter proposal made was based on the following two conditions. The first one was that um, we were proposing overall targets and that each organization should then be left to set its own race and gender split um, based either on the national EAP or the provincial EAP, whichever EAP the, the employer chooses to, to apply in its, in its plan. And then the second condition was that the minister could set a minimum threshold of 40 to 43% um, for, for the African population in each category. So most recently, about a month and a half ago, the Department of Employment and Labor contacted us again and said, can we um, consider revising our proposal and increase the, um, the percentage on top management as well as, as, well as disability? And after engagement with the members who are participating in the consultation process, it was decided um, that we would um, maintain the position which, which I've just described. So the Department of Employment and Labor acknowledged that and they said that they would discuss it amongst themselves and if necessary, let us know, um, let us know whether they want to meet with us to further discuss. Um, what's also important to note is that in terms of the amendment bill, if, if the um, empowering provision to, which allows the minister to, to set the numerical targets is passed, the minister must, before the targets are, um, are, are put in place or implemented, the minister must publish it in, in the government gazette for public comment. So there will be a public comment process on the targets that will eventually be proposed by, um, by the minister. What's also important to note is that when we were at NEDLAC in 2017, when we first started engaging on the amendment bill, was that the Department of Employment and Labor told us that they were going to um, set different targets for each sector because they acknowledged the skill sets and the, the demands and the circumstances of sectors are not the same. However, we've now learned, given um, the inquiries we've made with the other sectors who have also been engaging with the department and the proposed targets that the, the, the targets being proposed by the department for, for each of the sectors at this point in time are the same. They aren't, they aren't different as was told to us at, um, at NEGLA. And then just to um, conclude, I'm not sure if all the participants saw, but yesterday the Employment Equity Commission published its 20th um, annual employment equity report. And I think just if I could highlight, um, highlight some of the um, recordings from, from that report from a retail perspective, just so that participants have an idea of um, where there has been growth and where we're going backwards in terms of transformation. So for the 2019 year, according to the, the um, the, the report published yesterday for wholesale and retail, and that also includes the repair of motor vehicles and motorcycles. Um, the at, at top management for 2019, African male was at 4.3 percent, and but for 2018, African male was at 4.7 percent. So over the last year, there's actually actually been a reduction in um, in that occupational category for 2019. Um, at top management again, um, African female was at 2.2%. For 2018, it was at 2%. So there was um, a growth in respect of that category. And then for 2019, again, top management, white male sitting at 56.6%. And then in 2018, the year before, 59.8%. So there has been a decrease in that respect. For 2019, white females at top management sitting at 15%, whereas in 2018 sitting at 14.8%. So there's been a 0.2% growth there. And then from our sector, the, the report indicates that for 2019, 3,747 employers falling in our, in our category submitted employment equity 
equity reports. So the, the statistics that I've just um, set out come from those 3,747 reports. And then in terms of the CCMA statistics for the period end of April 2019 to February 2020, the CCMA in that period had, referred, had received 2,237 unfair discrimination referrals, had received 826 equal pay for work of equal value referrals, and then 182 referrals for, for sexual harassment cases. Um, but I'm going to hand back to hand back to Graham now so that he can introduce Randall. Thanks very much. Thanks. So yeah, this <coughs> fairly far reaching changes as I see it in terms of moving the establishment of targets from the workplace up through to the government. Um, it comes very close to striking me as setting quotas as opposed to targets. But Randall, maybe if you could just talk to some of the legal challenges that you think we may face in regard to this. And then I may ask you just one or two specific questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, and good morning to the, to the various panelists. Um, just uh, dovetailing with Siobhan's uh, insights, there appears to be a frustration on the department's part that in its assessment, the move towards equitable representation uh, of persons from the designated group is going a bit slowly. Um, whether or not that assessment is right or wrong is, is probably for another time, but it does seem to me that that sits at the heart of some of the amendments proposed in the bill. Uh, from a legal perspective, though, I think, Graham, you're right that there, there, there is a sea change that has been signaled now. Um, as all of us know, uh, insofar as numbers is concerned, the Employment Equity Act of 1998, um, uh, uh, as amended prior to the proposed bill's amendments, um, provides for an employment equity plan, provides for consultation at enterprise level as between employers and employees in determining progress towards more equitable representation. And it is in that uh, uh, context of consultation as between the enterprise on the one hand and its employees on the other hand that targets are then set uh, a joint consultation process as between labor uh, and management. What is now contemplated is rather than leave it to the enterprise level uh, as envisaged in the current arrangements under section 16 and 17 where you consult with your employees in order to determine the targets, the minister may now determine sectoral targets um, and I I do think that that is a very, very uh, significant move um, away from the current arrangements. The department has, since 1998, in the run-up to the Employment Equity Act of 1998, and in the explanatory memorandum to the Employment Equity Act of 1998, been careful to say that those targets proposed under the current arrangements are targets as opposed to quotas. There was a uh, an appropriate discomfort with the concept of quotas um, when dealing with equitable representation in the workplace. Um, the labor movement then certainly wasn't pushing for quotas. Civil society then was, was certainly not pushing for quotas. Uh, but we do see uh, a, a move now to, to try and hurry things along to speak casually. And, and I, I think there is appropriate concern in various sectors that we, we're moving away from a consensual, nuanced environment um, driven by workplace engagement to a more top-down environment. Um, and, and, and that change is, is quite significant. I, I would imagine that that sea change, to my mind, will be the subject of, of much contestation. Um, the, the, the changes to the bill, as Siobhan has alluded to, 
uh, can probably be divided into four broad categories. The one is the move towards sectoral targets. The other one is the implementation of Section 53, which then leads to compliance certificates, and I'll speak to that in a moment. Uh, the third one relates to psychological testing, uh, and the fourth one, um, some relief for, for small business in that a, a designated employer who used to be defined as an employer with more than 50 employees, alternatively fewer than 50 employees, but who meets a target set in Schedule 4 of the Act. Uh, and that target is a threshold uh, uh, on annual turnover for, re for the retail sector, it was 45 million rands. For agriculture, uh, it, was, it was 6 million rands and there are various thresholds for the, for, for the various sectors. And maybe just to start with, with that last category. So smaller employers are now relieved of the burden of being classified as designated uh, employers, which is quite significant because then they don't have all of the all of the admin and bureaucracy to engage with, and, and that is indeed some relief. As for the psychological testing and similar assessments, under the current arrangements, uh, those assessments which employers, if they elect to use them, those assessments have to be certified by the Health Professions Council, and that's quite a complex procedure. Uh, that certification requirement is, is, is now done away with under, under the bill, Again, I think that is a, a positive development. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the big ticket item is the setting of, of targets. So the minister is now uh, empowered to determine sectors or identify sectors in the language of the bill. And after consultation with the National Wage Commission, to then determine sectoral targets, and the bill says, for the purpose of ensuring equitable representation of people from designated groups. And, and now, now we have a number of potential grounds for legal challenge. It is unclear at this stage exactly what factors the minister will take into account as he groups or identifies a sector. And even having done so, it is it is, there is some uncertainty as to how the minister will arrive at some of the targets that he might well set. Um, earlier on, in, in an earlier uh, uh, iteration of the proposed bill, there was a, a whole series of consultative steps before the minister uh, could determine the targets. Some of that has been done away with. Um, there is, however, now still a requirement that the minister must consult with, with the National Wage Commission, which I thought was rather interesting as opposed to the Commission on Employment Equity. Um, but be that as it may, it's uncertain why, why that move was, was, was thought to be necessary. Uh, and so we now have a situation where the minister will determine the targets. And then quite crucially, and, and this I think is where the big challenge will lie, Graham, once those targets have been set, every employer, designated employer, who is required to submit employment equity reports and have an employment equity plan, must now ensure that its targets determined in consultation with its employees is aligned with the numerical targets to be set at a sectoral level by the minister. In other words, whatever else the employer at an enterprise level and its employees may think about targets, those targets have to be aligned with those that the minister will determine. Um, and to my mind, I, I would imagine that, that employers and their employees will probably, will probably have quite a bit to say about about that because you have a provision in the act which is now rendered somewhat of a dead letter what what would be the point of consultation at the enterprise level to determine a workplace plan or an employment equity plan with targets if it is going to be imposed imposed by the minister there is some disquiet um, industry-wide i know also from the financial services sector um, as to the approach taken so far by the department, because 
it is thought not only in financial services and retail that some of the targets are simply unachievable. As Siobhan has given us uh, an indication of those numbers, top management 50%, senior management 60% and middle management 75 I've not seen over the last six or seven years any employment uh, equity plan, the, the product of consultation at enterprise level, which has come anywhere near to proposing these, these kinds of targets. That being the case, I would, I would imagine that there is at least some room for, for some debate as to, as to whether those targets are achievable, because setting ambitious targets is one thing, setting targets that in the ordinary course, uh, employees in the workplace and the employer appreciate are not really achievable, um, does, does uh, potentially set up a, a destructive element because if those targets aren't reached, then potentially down the line in a few years time, uh, the penalty provisions of the act could kick in. Um, and, and I would imagine that they'll be contesting there uh, as well. Um, and then maybe, maybe lastly, uh, as part of this broad overview, overview, Graham, the, the engagement with the Department of Employment and Labor so far um, is also a matter of some concern. Uh, rather, rather than signal to industry, signal to various economic sectors, these are the factors that we take into account in determining these targets. The department seems quite uh, uh, set on determining a target which it is informed by industry is, is over ambitious and in other sectors they've been told is simply not achievable. Uh, and that, that lack of consultative approach, that lack of, to use a, a, a grand constitutional term, rationality in determining a target might well also be the subject of court scrutiny down the line. Randall, thanks very much. I'm going to, I know there are lots of questions I'd like to ask you, but um, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to move on because I need to give Roz and Mendel a shot as well. So um, thank you for that. What I, Roz, I want to turn to the issue of the move to online trading. Um, you know, certainly the sort of all the kind of layman reports suggest that uh, there's a significant move from brick and mortar to online sales for the retail industry. And that has significant changes for and implications for an employment perspective, because with a move to online, you obviously then start up, you know, increasing the size of your call centers, you increase the size of your warehouse and distribution models, and you, um, at, on, at the same time, you also possibly increase the deliveries that you do as well. Um, Siobhan, I'm going to give you half a second just to comment on, I know that you, as, as the Retail Association, have been looking at this question of move from brick and mortar to online. Maybe just a couple of comments before I have to turn over to Roz to ask her about the legal implications. Thank you, Graham. I will be brief. In, during the course of 2018, the Retail Association commissioned research on the future of work in our sector to, to try and understand or look what the jobs in our sector will look like by the year 2035. And it was quite a comprehensive research study. It, there were three phases. We did what they call a social media listening. We did, we, we um, instructed a, um, the Stellen, um, University of Stellenbosch, they've got what they call future thinkers to do the research. And then we also had a skills expert to have a look at what skills are necessary to do those jobs by 2035. And really the reason why we did the, the research was to tr number one, try and influence the WNR CETA on its skills plans and what, what training it funds. The second one was to make retailers aware of what skills they need to plan for going, um, going forward. And then also to, um, to have research available to, to counter arguments that are often made by, um, by the labor constituency insofar as their understanding of the future of work in retail is concerned. 
So what's important to note is that the, the research we did was obviously pre-COVID-19, COVID but in essence, the outcome of the research was at that point in time that brick and mortar stores will remain in, in South Africa. We're not gonna see a situation where all stores close down and we will have exclusive online, online shopping. But I think that um, now during COVID-19 and also post COVID-19, there's, there's been an increase in online sales for almost all retailers who, who, who provide, provide that offering. And then also the click and collect options where you, you buy online, but you physically drive to a store or a, or a DC center or depot and you collect your, your, your shopping. So I think there's been a, I, I'm not saying that our, the outcomes of our research would change simply because of COVID, but I think there's definitely been an increase in the online sales, which will then obviously leave employers reconsidering the, the structure of how they do, how they do or how they offer their business um, within a retail, retail setting. Because what consumers now want is they want convenience, they want safety and they want speed, speed of delivery. Um, and I, so that's really the condensed version, Graham. Um, and I, I'm happy to, if anyone is interested, I know that a lot of people find the future of work topic very boring and tiresome, but if anyone is interested in seeing the research reports, we can make those available to the participants. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yvonne. So Roz, what we, we just need to consider the implications of this because we're going to see increasingly, as I say, that you know you will have a workforce that's in your brick and mortar stores, but equally you're going to have a workforce that are in your warehouse distribution and call centers. And we've had bargaining council agents pitch up at stores and say that the scooter drivers, for instance, who are doing the deliveries fall within the freight, the, the road transport freight industry. So um, just let's talk about the implications of that, if you don't mind. Um, thanks, Gwen. Thanks, Siobhan. Hi, everyone. Um, I think the key issue that we've got to, we'd have to look at in each case would be how the business is, is run. It, it would be how it is, um, well, what the business model is. So there is a significant overlap between the wholesale and retail industry and between the road freight industry. And the reason I say that is the wholesale and retail industry is primarily uh, is that sector where th um, the employer and the employees are mainly or primarily associated for the purpose of procuring products uh, from any supplier to sell to any person. However, the, the wholesale and retail sector then also includes your warehousing activities, your distribution, where warehousing and distribution are ancillary to the procuring of goods for sale. The road freight and logistics industry, on the other hand, is the industry in which the employer and the employees are primarily associated for the transportation of goods uh, via road freight. But there again, uh, in the definition, it includes the warehousing and storage of goods. So you've got that, that um, overlap. The key distinction or the key issue for determination is whether or not you are transporting your own goods or you're warehousing your own goods or whether you're doing it for reward. Because in order to fall within the road freight and logistics industry, it's the transportation of goods for reward. It's the warehousing of goods, ancillary to transportation for reward. So it, as I said to start with, it depends on the, on the business model, because if your business model is such that you have a big retailer that has its own warehousing and distribution, falls into the same uh, PTY Limited, um, then they would be storing their own goods. They would be transporting or distributing their own goods. They would definitely fall outside of road freight. Where it becomes more complicated is where you have a separate legal entity, a subsidiary, doing your warehousing and your distribution. Because then, if you look at it, it may very well be that the distribution and the warehousing falls within road freight. And there it becomes quite complicated because you have to look at what business is ancillary. Um, so that would be a key consideration. What is also important to remember is you may have outsourced your, your road freight, your distribution, in which case your warehousing could be part of the retail, but the distribution, so the same employees 
who are in the warehouse, but they do the distribution port, uh, portion may fall within road freight. So it's always important to look at what is the business model and what is the primary business. Uh, you're, on, you're on mute, Graham. Sorry, my apologies. Um, so uh, where you outsource, because we've had this before as well, if you say, for instance, outsource to one of these uh, dedicated warehouse people like Value or Unitrans or somebody like that, what is the consequence of that? If you outsource, so let's say, take a step back. If historically you've done your own warehousing and logistics and you decide to outsource that function to a Unitrans or to a Value, the, the, the issue there, what, what's key there is that you would then, those employees who were previously in the wholesale and retail sector will then fall under the road freight um, bargaining um, council. And the reason for that is the service provider would then be providing a service for reward. So the, insofar as the warehousing and the logistics is, is done, it's then done for reward and it falls then squarely within road freight. Um, the implications from a cost perspective is that your minimum wages in the road freight industry are different to your minimum wages in the wholesale and retail industry. And I think they are quite uh, a lot higher. So it may mean that the wage bill will go up quite significantly. So it could have a significant impact there, which means that the outsource service provider will charge you more. Then. Okay. So in my example of the uh, scooter drivers, essentially if I'm, if I'm a retailer and I'm employing my driving this then to Mr. Delivery, they fall into the road freight sector. Yes, if you're outsourcing it to Mr. Delivery, then it very, very possibly does fall into road freight. Uh, if it's your own scooter drivers, um, so you employ the scooter di drivers directly, then it will fall into wholesale and retail in all likelihood. Okay, so this whole, it's, it's very important with this move as to how we determine the structure of this thing, whether we keep it in the entity that is the retailer or we hive it out and put it into a different entity or we outsource it entirely because each one of those has a different implication for terms and conditions of employment effectively. So before we do these things, we've got to think very, very carefully about where we house these new businesses effectively. Yes. And we also would need to, um, one of the things that I think is very important to, to consider is we've seen a lot, not necessarily in the retail industry, but uh, there have been a lot of instances where I've been involved in a business that is outsourcing part of its business and then later decides to insource it again because they believe they can do it differently. So in the event that a retailer outsources its warehousing and logistics, then all of those employees will fall under road freight bargaining council, their terms and conditions will, will change and they'll be covered by the main collective agreement. In the event that that retailer then chooses or elects to insource that service again, take it away, then although they won't suddenly, the, the, the retailer won't suddenly fall into road freight, their employees will remain um, in effectively covered by the main collective agreement, uh, specifically if it's a section 197 transfer, because where there's a section 197 transfer, collective agreements will transfer with the employees. So those employees will still be governed by the main collective agreement that is in place at the time. And even once that collective agreement expires, they would still enjoy those terms and conditions. And it would be quite tricky to change the terms and conditions um, insofar as they would be worse off following a 197. So you may find that you had employees doing a job uh, at a specific rate, you outsource two years later you bring them back and you have to pay them quite a significant amount more. So it's always important to look at your long-term strategy and what you're seeking to achieve so that you don't find down the line um, that there is a greater difficulty in then realigning your employees. Um, and that also then begs the question is how easy is it to ring fence those employees or are you going to face equal work for equal pay 
um, claims from your ordinary retail employees who are governed by the, the, the sectoral determination? Thank you, Rose. Yeah, some, certainly some interesting challenges. Mendel, in the, in the light of all of this, clearly what we're facing is many scenarios where we are requiring workers to work differently and to work different on different terms and conditions of employment. In COVID, we've been faced with requiring workers not to work, to actually stay at home, to be laid off, not to work the hours that they work. Very often we need the same numbers of workers, we just need them to work differently on different terms and conditions or we don't need them to work with a different skill set. How easy is it to change terms and conditions of employment using, for instance, a retrenchment if these workers are unwilling to work on your new, new terms and conditions? So, hi. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Graham. You just broke up at the end there. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the question being, uh, can employees be fairly dismissed if they refuse to accept changes to terms and conditions of employment? Um, the answer to that question, of course, is the, is the same as the answer to every legal question ever posed. <laughs> it depends. Um, <laughs> that, uh, and it depends on a number of a number of uh, circumstances, of course, and it depends on the interpretation, in particular, of Section 187.1c of the Labour Relations Act, um, which relates to automatically unfair unfair dismissals, and of course the the um, application of Section 189 and 189a afterwards relating to to retrenchments. Um, the the we discussed at the part one of the the this uh, webinar series um uh, obtaining consent um to to the changes to terms and conditions of employment and if there was an agreement that it was would all all be in order of course the problem comes where an employer is required to change terms and conditions of employment the employees aren't willing to do to agree to that and what can the employer then do um, over and above um, implementing it unilaterally and that giving rise to to mutual interest dispute and the, the, the problems we discussed previously. Um, section 187, of course, um, uh, 187.1c uh, creates an automatically unfair or relates to automatically unfair dismissals. Um, and if you dismiss employees for refusing to accept change to terms and conditions of employment, that may, of course, amount to an automatically unfair dismissal. Um, the change to the, 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 the relevant sections um, happened in, in about 2015 um, when the LRA was amended uh, last. And the case is current, a case in this regard, we call the or commonly referred to as the Ving Trident case. Is, is currently before the Constitutional Court, where the Constitutional Court must consider uh, the interpretation of Section 1871C, um, uh, the new Section 1871C. The old Section 1871C, um, uh, an employer who wished to implement changes to terms and conditions of employment could of course do so if its proposed changes were rejected by the, by the employees. And the, um, provided that the, the retention was final and irrevocable um, and, and in accordance with the requirements of Section 189 of the, of the LRA. Now the, the new Section 1871C and the interpretation that the Labour Court agreed with and that the Labour Appeal Court agreed with siding with the employer party or finding in favour of the employer party in both, both those courts was that the new section appears to provide that a dismissal will only be automatically unfair if the reason for the dismissal is a refusal by the employees to accept a demand in respect of a matter of mutual interest. So the matter is now currently before, before the, the, this matter before the Constitutional Court and just not to take up too much time, um, but the Ving, Ving Trident, Trident facts related um, to changes or redefining or reassigning of job descriptions because of a decrease in sales and increased costs. So financial 
financial pressures, pressures and the jobs were, 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 were redefined by the employer. The employees, uh, of course, were unhappy with it. They, there was negotiations. Um, there was an impasse in the negotiations and the employer then implemented the redesigned job descriptions. So this case is now pending before the, the Constitutional Court, as I said, and I won't go into the, the, the arguments either way um, uh, uh, of the parties through the various courts. But just to, in summary of, of, of where the law is now and why the, why the courts found that, um, the, why the Labour Appeal Court found that a dismissal, that an employer can dismiss in these circumstances, uh, provided that the reason for the dismissal or the proximate or main cause for the dismissal is the its bona fide and valid operational requirements um, and not a attempt by the employer to get the employees to, to agree um, to change the terms and conditions of employment as part of a power play or, or uh, a, a wage negotiation scenario, for example. The, the cause must be the actual operational requirements. And why the court found, found that was um, that, or, 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 or why it, it sided with the, the arguments of the employer party is that if the, if the other interpretation was to be favored, um, it would lead to, uh, or it leads to the anomaly where employee, employers are wary of offering re-employment to employees as part of, of when, when retrenchments have taken place already. Um, it also means that if you cannot dismiss in these circumstances and you have to resort to a power play, then the employer is placed under even more financial pressure um, uh, because the employer has gotten to this position because of the financial pressure to begin with. Um, the third, the third uh, reason was that um, the employer will also uh, fear offering alternatives, viable alternatives to employees during, during the, the, the retrenchment process um, uh, because of the, the, the fear that, that the, uh, uh, employees will will say that the, the the dismissals were automatically unfair. Um, the last the last uh, uh, reason for the for for this was or the the the, uh, the court siding with the employers was that in event trident the reason for the for the determinations the reason for the dismissals was an actual valid operational requirement and not and not any other reason. So. Um, the, the important piece is that the proximate cause or the dominant cause of the dismissals must be the operational requirements of the employer. And if that is the case, then a dismissal in these circumstances will be, will be, will be fair. Um, uh, and, and it mustn't be part of an attempt or stratagem by the employer to gain the upper hand in collective bargaining or as part of a, of a power play stratagem. It must be there must be a valid, a valid operational requirement that is linked to the, the viability and survival, survival of the business. So, Thanks, Mendel. There's, yeah. there, there's a question here, which is, you know, does the same apply where there's a takeover by one employer and you want to now align terms and conditions? But that, I presume, would be governed by 197. Yes. Um, where the, they would have to come over on exactly the same terms and conditions of employment. And then the new employer would have to have an, either an operational reason to terminate. It, it couldn't do it merely for convenience because it wants to align conditions. Am I right? That's correct. There'd have to be a, 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 a valid and a bona fide a reason, operational reason for it. And, and of course, the, that's for, a, would be for a court to determine uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, but it's important that that in, the, in this process, and if employers embark on a process like this, um, that the uh, notes from the consultations and the negotiations and the 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 record of the process and what the employer's reason was for embarking on this process um, and 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 attempting to terms and conditions consensually first, but then when that wasn't possible. Um, proceeding with a, 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 a retrenchment process in terms of 189, 
um, because of its operational requirements, is being able to justify or prove to a court afterwards that there was a valid reason. So to quote um, uh, uh, a quote from uh, the movie Training Day with Denzel Washington, you know, it's not, it's not what you know, but it's what you can prove. And, and it's important for employers to know that they can do this, that if there is a valid operational reason that, that terms and that employees can be ultimately fairly dismissed if they refuse to accept such changes. But in order to justify that and be able to uh, immunize themselves against a claim of unfair dismissal at a later stage and convince a court that the dismissal was fair, it's important to keep all the evidence and all the documents and all the, the records of why the decision was made and what justifies the, the valid uh, operational reason, what that valid operational reason was, so that can be used afterwards. And that was ultimately in, in a then trident in the Labour Court and the Labour Appeal Court, why the employer party was successful there because they were able to marshal all the necessary evidence um, and present it to the court in order to, to prove that they did have a valid reason and that this just was, this wasn't just part of a power play stratagem to get employees to agree to lesser terms and conditions of employment, less favorable conditions. Of employment. I'm going to ask you one last question coming from a panelist and then we need to move on because I'm giving you five minutes to deal with the uh, challenges being faced by part-time employees. But when you've got, uh, you need to change terms and conditions for an, uh, an operational reason because you've got a different, different operational requirement, are you obliged to then go down the 189 route? And must you do so? Or can you deal with it as a negotiation and the collective bargaining lockout type route? Where do you start? Yeah, they're both, in the, the, they're both possible. Um, the, the starting point would, would be a, a dialogue, of course, um, to see yes. If you could, if you could get an agreement on it, because then it doesn't matter. If you get the agreement, then it doesn't. Then you don't have to go either of the the um, the confrontational routes, either through a mutual interest dispute or a, a a claim in the in the labor court in relation to an automatically unfair dismissal or dismissal for operational requirements. Um, but if of, if if the employees refuse to accept and you can't get an agreement after dialogue. Um, uh, then, of course, the, uh, um, it, you can go the, 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 the power play route, um, but to, to, to uh, out, and that power play then continues until, until one side buckles. Um, the employees can't obviously be dismissed as part of that process. If ultimately the employer says it, it can't hold its breath for the, for the, the, the period of the power play, um, employees went on strike um, then it is it is better then to start the dialogue if the dialogue doesn't work say we are compelled to start a 189 process and of course again whether 189a is applicable or not might change the employer's man, mind and it might rather revert to the, the the collective bargaining mutual interest dispute scenario if you have to wait 60 or 90 days to conclude that process but if it can be concluded speedily Whatever the alternatives are that were offered as part of the negotiation um, uh, could now be offered as alternatives to the retrenchment during the retrenchment consultation. And then it remains to be seen whether those alternatives, if refused, uh, amounts to an unreasonable refusal of an alternative to the extent that an employer may not be required to pay uh, severance pay. Um, but the, the two routes are available, probably lean towards the retrenchment, but that depends on one, whether 189A is applicable or not. All right, so with part-timers, I just want to allude to the problem and uh, you can just say what they are because we're not going to have time to answer what, how, how, how to answer the problems that we face. But obviously with uh, retail, we're moving, you know, they've moved to a seven-day trading week. Uh, the hours are extensive and way beyond an eight-hour uh, eight hour working day. The consequence being is that a lot of um, employers in the retail sector are employing part time employees. And they're permitted to do so in terms of sectoral determination nine, which creates two categories of employee, well, three basically, but the two I'm interested in is a 40 or less hour worker who works on a, nor on a Sunday for normal pay, and uh, your 45 hour who works on a Sunday for either time and a half or double time, depending whether it's a normal working day. 
but we're increasingly facing challenges by these part-timers. If you can just allude to what the challenges are, I'm not going to ask you to answer how we answer them, but um, if you could just give a heads up as to the kind of challenges we're facing. Yeah, so the, 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 the sort of the justification for uh, sectoral determination line, of course, is that it does give some benefits to the 40-hour uh, employee, the person who works less than that, they get two full days off. And if they do have to work on the days that they, that they have off, then they get that double time premium as well. Um, but unfortunately, um, that legalized or lawful uh, differentiation between full-timers and part-timers regarding Sunday work does create the risk for the employer of claims arising either in terms of section 198C um, which relates to the protection of, of part-time employees, atypical uh, employees in atypical employment. Um, and then secondly, there is the risk of an, of, I beg your pardon, an unfair discrimination claim in terms of the, the uh, Employment Equity Act Section 6.4, um, uh, where the employer differentiates between the, if you can call them full-timers and part-timers, and whether that differentiation amounts to discrimination and whether that discrimination is unfair. This, of course, the, 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 the section 198C protections would only relate to persons earning below the earnings threshold um, of 205,433 Rand. Um, those part-time employees must be treated on the whole, not less favorably than comparable full-time employees, unless, of course, there's a justifiable reason for that different treatment as we know, that justifiable reasons could be merit, seniority, length of service, the quality of the work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are risks of a claim in terms of 189HC. There are defenses that the employer has to it. It can, for justifiable reasons, and you know, we can get, it will obviously have time to unpack that, but in the retail sector and the current environment, you will, there are, everyone can, can, can think of what those justifiable reasons would be. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, going on to the second potential claim that, that employers could face uh, is in relation to uh, the Employment Equity Act. Um, and there, of course, uh, you know, the, 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 the Act provides or, or, or prohibits unfair discrimination. And it's unfair discrimination if there's a difference in terms and conditions of between employees of the same employer performing the same or substantially the same work or work of equal value. Um, and that there is, and that and that 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 difference is either directly or indirectly based on one or more of the listed grounds, or an uh, unlisted ground, arbitrary grounds. And again, that takes some time to 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 speak to. Um, but clearly, there is a prima facie case of differentiation um, between part timers and full timers. It's then a question of whether that difference of differentiation um, is amounts to uh, discrimination on probably an arbitrary ground and that that ground being um, uh, the discrimination against part-timers who are a group of people who, you know, who have less protection than, than, than full-time than full-time employees so that's the that's the two possible difficulties of, that employers may face now in the current environment you may want to have more flexibility and have have uh, uh, more workers that working less hours. So there might be a move towards employing more part-time employees now. Um, and those will come with risks. Um, there are, there are, are, are serious risks arising in terms of the Employment Equity Act and the LRA, but there are also very good defenses available to employees. And unfortunately, the, the, the Employment Equity Act and the LRA says that, that they prevail if any legislation conflicts with them, but the BCEA does not do that. Um, and sectoral determination nine, of course, has been uh, promulgated in terms of the BCEA. So unfortunately, the LRA and the Employment Equity Act will, will hold sway in, in, in these circumstances. But again, that's the legal, that's what the legislation says, but it also allows, and there are plenty of defenses available to employees sorry, employers in these circumstances to ward off claims that part-timers may, may bring. Thanks very much for that. I just wanted to allude to the fact that we are facing these kind of challenges at the moment and we are dealing with them and they are out there. 
and I think they're going to grow as the numbers of part-timers grow. But thank you, that's all the time we have. Um, thank you, panelists, it's been incredibly interesting from my perspective, so thank you very much for your participation. Thank you to the audience for making the time to join us. Um, I'm afraid it was a bit rushed, but we had some four very important topics to cover, and I hope we've done them justice in the short time we gave them. Thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks. <laughs>